Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Joe Kuzma and Brian E. Roach. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and as always, I am joined by the roadrunner to my wily coyote, a one of Mr. Brian E. Roach. Meep, meep. What's up, buddy? Meep, meep. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that noise. You know, I was trying to figure out which one of us would be wily because I think we're both wily. Uh, That's true. Yes, I'll buy that. I, I mean, it really, I mean, it was kind of foreshadowing that cartoon because now everything comes in an Amazon box. They just had Acme wrong. So yes, that's exactly yes. <laughs> I mean, you could probably order a bomb from Amazon or something of that nature. Or you know, I don't want to give anybody any ideas. We should probably jump right into the topic, which is. Part two, I don't think it's going to be a part three. I think we're going to do defense and special teams together because, well, there's not a whole lot to talk about with special teams, but we talked about in a previous episode, what was that, last week or a week and a half ago about kind of veered off into the Antonio Brown trading and Le'Veon Bell leaving and blah, blah, blah. What are the Steelers' offensive priorities for the offseason? So now we have to cover the defense, and we're going to lump special teams in there too since there's only a handful of positions. And you know what? I think I'm going to talk about special teams first. Let's mix it up just a little bit because sure. uh, what do we got going on here? We have uh, Jordan Berry is, uh, is going to be – it needs to be re-signed if the Steelers don't want to bring in different punters. And I think they're going to, at least as has been the case, bring in somebody to battle with them. I don't know that they'll draft a punter. Probably somebody that's a street free agent or undrafted college free agent. But I think Jordan Berry needs some competition, but I also want to see him back at camp. What do you think? I actually believe that pretty much every position – uh, on special teams yes. is open to competition this year. Uh, long snapper, returners, even though I like Ryan Switzer, I think it's still open for competition. Both the punter and the kicker. Um, I don't see any reason for it not to be that way. Uh, nobody last season stood out as uh, being above and beyond uh, and and without the ability to be improved upon. So, hey. I hope Kevin Colbert is right. I hope uh, Chris Boswell figures his world out because we know we love uh, we love old uh, Wizard of Boz. Um, but if he doesn't, hey, you know, it's the way it goes, man. That's the life of a kicker. It is the life of a kicker. Most people probably aren't aware that uh, Matt McCrane, who was brought in for Week 17, actually signed a contract that wasn't just for Week 17. So tentatively he's the one penciled in to come to camp i have a lot more faith that chris boswell will be in camp before matt mccrane because if they find something better along the usual free agent slash draft slash after draft free agents that are out there including let's not discount some of these people that are kicking in the uh, alliance of american football right now who are making all of their kicks surprisingly i mean uh for the most part these guys have been very sharp as opposed to the nfl kickers <laughs> you know Maybe not. Maybe, you know what I think it is in the AAF? Less pressure, less pressure. And, you know, uh, I hope to talk to our buddy of the show here, a, fr a good friend, Jeff Reed, about some of this here in the near future. I had been uh, talking to him via text, and he's looking forward to talking about it because it's a whole different world when it comes to pressure. You know what I mean? We're talking about like a minor, yeah. minor type league. These guys go back up to the NFL, then. I mean, who do you got, like Nick Novak or whatever? We'll just throw him out there. Maybe he misses like three field goals in two weeks because it's a pressure cooker for that. And I think that's Boswell's problem. There were some talks about him having like a grade two groin strain, and I'm no medical expert. I don't know what that means. I just know it's part of his leg. I don't know if it was part of his kicking leg or plant leg. I don't think it matters. Having uh, When we talk to Jeff, if you want to learn about all the kicking game, go back and find that episode. It's definitely up on YouTube, somewhere buried on the website too. But uh, Boswell will be there if they don't find a better alternative McCrane will be there uh Barry I wouldn't mind seeing but I mean it, you know it's so tough to find a punter and I was so like 
I was stuck on Barry when they first got him because the guy had a cannon of a leg. They traded Brad Wing away. Brad Wing is now punting in the AAF too because he's found his way out of the league. And, you know, it's just one of those – it's a volatile position because you only carry – most teams usually carry only one of each of those. And I also want to say Cam Canada uh, could be on the chopping block too. And you know what? He won his job over the guy we defended the Steelers drafting a long snapper. And <laughs> that didn't work uh. out there either. I mean, it, you know, it's tough. Greg Warren was around what? Like, you know, five decades or <laughs> I'm just teasing. I was like, but he was one of the guys who won two Super Bowl rings. So he was around for a long time, a trusty veteran. And he left about two years ago. And and, you know, it's hard to replace something like that. So I agree with you. I think all the special teams positions, obviously ret- kick returns don't mean a hill of beans anymore. So it's going to be whatever, right. whatever running backs or receivers that end up uh, getting tossed into that role. And uh, it, we don't have to worry about talking about Antonio Brown being a punt returner, apparently. And uh, it always, it's always good to have a backup for Switzer, too. Yeah, I, I agree. I, we we don't have to we don't have to talk about Mr. Big Chest, um, and <laughs> but we just did. <laughs> we did. We didn't have to, but we did. Um, and uh, you know, look here's the thing about Ryan Switzer. While I, he for the most part he was fine, you know, as, as much as he jitterbugged around, nothing spectacular ever happened. So that's why I'm going to say even that position is up for grabs. Well, I mean, I think they're going to go. We're talking about the alliance. I think that's where the NFL's headed is this is the experiment. You know, are they going to get rid of the kickoffs? And it's kind of exciting, too. I, I, I kind of like like the seamless transition. I won't like it if I'm a fan in the stands because that's usually when I go and get in line to relieve myself. Uh, so then you're going to miss parts of the game. And I, I think that natural break is also needed for people who are watching uh, maybe at a bar and consuming too many adult beverages as well. Um, but anyway, I digress. We're going to get into the defense here i was looking you know free agent list depth charts and i guess the first thing to do is go to defensive line they've already uh, signed as we had uh put on our uh, our i don't know magician's caps or looked into the crystal ball and saw that tyson alu alu has been re-signed to your contract i believe and we kind of predicted that he joins uh, cam hayward javon hargrave who i feel is on the upswing stefan to who's been I would say steadily rising. You know, we were kind of grading these draft picks. We looked at the 2014 draft uh, not too long ago, and I'd say he's still upward. We know Cam is a grown ass man. So you got those three Absolutely. guys. You got Alu Alu. Uh, so you got four guys now, and maybe some people that'll come to camp that have been around practice squads and whatnot. Two free agents, Dan McCullers, LT Walton. Uh, depending on what goes on with that, um, you know, my, my boy LT, you know, flashes here or there, but is what it is. You know, he's, he's out of his rookie contract now. Tough to get that second contract sometimes. Sixth round draft pick in 2015. Didn't play a whole lot last season. Not, you know, not a whole lot there. McCullers actually showed some flashes with new coaching. Will they have patience for another year? I can't say. So, how big of a need? This offseason, free agency and draft is the defensive line. I got to put it probably near the bottom of the priority list, to be completely honest. Um, I, I probably will have it slightly higher than that. And here's, here's why um, the team plays so much sub package football and gets away from their, uh, you know, their base defense enough that they oftentimes have four D linemen out there. And right now, as it stands, um, that in my mind, is Cameron Hayward, Hargrave to it, and Alu Alu. And that, you just don't have enough productive depth behind that. Uh, as you said, McCullers had some moments, but he kind of faded off towards the end of the season. Um, and I think it's reasonable to think at this point the Dan McCullers experiment may be over, and even his ginormous, huge man size will not be enough to get him another one-year contract. But at the same time as I say that, it's not going to surprise me if they say come to camp and here's a year and, and see what happens because he ain't going to get big bucks. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? We were talking about this with the offense and tight ends. Uh, I'll, I'll play a devil's advocate here and say um, which one has a better chance of coming to camp, Dan McCullers or Xavier Grimble? Uh, I'm going to say 
I'm going to say Dan McCullers, to be quite honest with you. Um, I, I'm with you 100% of the way. Why? Because we said, you know, the fumble thing and this and that, and it's like, yep. mm, it's hard to forgive. You know what I mean? It's just, it really is. Um, I don't know. Fitzgerald that humble thing's going to bother me. <laughs> yeah, the, the Fitzgerald Toussaint never never recovered from that, uh, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, that's I, I look at it the same way with the defensive line, but I look at the, everything else, which is kind of lumped together because it's like, okay, there's linebackers and there's the secondary. Well, technically there's outside linebacker. Technically there's inside linebacker. Technically there's cornerbacks. There's nickel corners. There's your safeties. And this thing, it can be hodgepodge. I mean, um, Bud Dupree, a lot of money. What, like nine, nine something, nine point three million? Nine mil. Yeah, yeah, somewhere around there. Uh, on his fifth year option, will be a free agent. I mean, it looks like they're gonna stick with this option, even though it's a lot of money. See, I don't have a problem with Bud Dupree. I have a problem with the business end of Bud Dupree and what he's getting paid that's kind of tough to swallow when you look at the Bud Dupree production uh Bud Dupree as a player I don't necessarily have a problem with if he had a lower price tag so that's where business comes in for it I've been a defender of Bud Dupree but again I think the time I think the clock is running out there and it becomes tougher now because when you look at uh, everything else that's here I mean there's TJ Watt obviously great that was a that was a hit uh, we all thought he was just going to be Oh, this is a guy you're taking because of the name. You know what I mean? A family name. Uh, is the same thing in his bloods as, as his brother, JJ? Yes. Yes, it is, apparently. Yep. Um, and then what else is there? I mean, you had Keon Adams, who was a seventh-round pick a couple years ago. He, uh, practice squad-type guy, wasn't on the main roster. Uh, Anthony Chicolo, once again, this whole free agent deal. I have to look him up. He, I don't know that he is even restricted now. I think he's unrestricted finally. So they've kind of had their him under their thumb for the last few years. May not be the case. Decent role player. I think he's grown. Uh, I would love to see him grow some more. But again, how much time are you willing to allow? And again, it's business. So you got to see what it's going to cost you in the long run. Uh, let me see. Uh, you know, there, there's some other names that they've thrown out. They've they've been signing guys from here and there and futures contracts and that. I'm not even gonna bother with that right now. They're gonna have to like really show something like, um, you know, Robert Spillane, for example. Like, okay, I think the the elephant in the room here is is uh, just how much development is there for Ola Adenae. You know, he was he went on IR and then came back, and he didn't really get any regular season snaps. He looked like a, a man amongst men when you're talking about the preseason, but you're talking about the preseason. What if he goes against ones or twos in the preseason? Does he look just as dominant? I don't know. I think that's what we're going to see now. So you, you basically you have almost like two and a half guys because like the Bud Dupree thing, it's like they're kind of forced into bringing Bud there. So outside linebacker, basically your edge defender – if we're talking about drafting a guy, priority-wise, it's tough because we haven't gotten into the secondary yet. <laughs> and we talked about yeah. wide receiver already. But I think it's somewhere in the middle of the pack. It's definitely something they're going to have to address with uh, one or two acquisitions this offseason. Yeah, I, the way I look at Bud, and, and this is a, a different angle, I, I agree with you. The, the $9 million bothers me a little bit. But at the same time, uh, I'm looking at this and saying, okay – Bud showed improvement last season. If you give him this one year at a, at a what is realistically a high price for what he's done in the past, but is not that high for a decent, uh, you know, outside linebacker. If you were had to pick one up off a of free agency and you wanted a good, you know, tier player, um, but you know they keep him around for another year, give him one more chance to continue to show the improvement, and see if he can harness uh, all those physical traits into something again. I mean, he's only, he's had one year on the other side now. Uh, it was clearly the right move for TJ as well as probably Bud. And let's see what happens. And then they can cut bait after this. Whereas on the flip side, if you tie him up to a multi-year deal with signing bonuses and things like that, even though you may get a better year-to-year -year price, now you've got dead cap money if you decide to release him down the road. Um, if it doesn't pan out. So I can kind of see devil's advocate why maybe they're going to go ahead and stick at least one more year here. Um, but then you you brought up the two things that I think are the key points is what is going to be the development of guys like Keon Adams and Ola. 
Um, I, I to me, Chicolo is if he gets another chance in camp, that's about the most I can expect. Uh, the best thing he can expect is a minimum contract. If if they offer, if they even offer him that. Uh, I don't know that he's going to get it anywhere else. The production just isn't there, even though he's been at least a, you know, feasible backup, I guess. Um, but if Ola and if uh, Keon can come forward and move their games ahead, all of a sudden your problems start to go away. Now you've got a little bit of depth there. Now you've got a little bit of, uh, you know, room to wiggle. But you don't know that yet. It's that just as you said. So in my view, this is a need. Is it a top need? Nah, I kind of put it somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, and 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 it may get elevated depending on how draft boards fall. You know, I it's going to be. I don't think that the linebacker free agent market is all that great. So I don't know that they're going to pick anybody up in free agency here to try and fill this role. Um, and. While there's some decent players at the edge in the draft, again, the question mark is, is it a higher priority than some other things? No, it's not. But if one of the positions that is a higher priority, I'm trying not to specifically spell it out yet since we haven't gotten to it yet. But if one of the positions <laughs> is a, a, yeah, there you go, uh, is a higher priority, doesn't fit. In other words, it becomes a huge reach where they are because the guys they had their eyes on are gone. That could move this up into a higher level priority uh, just based on the way the board falls. I will assume they will draft a linebacker somewhere in this draft. But, uh, you know, the question is, is it an outside linebacker or an inside linebacker? And I kind of would go, I think they're going to draft one of each. Yes, absolutely. Um, def- no doubt there. I, You know what? It's funny that you say that because – uh, I had like I had like two things here for you. I was kind of thinking uh, aloud, and I'm like, Anthony Chicolo, uh, does he play somewhere in the NFL this year? I believe so. Um, I, I think he gets signed somewhere, but probably not a whole lot. Maybe a better opportunity to play, and that's kind of tough too because I, I wonder if that's something he's thinking about, or if he kind of knows his role and he feels comfortable in being like a special teams guy and a rotational player. What I don't see the Steelers doing here is. I don't see them using a first-round draft pick on an edge defender. I don't even know that that's going to be in the rumblings right now. And a lot of that has to do with Mr. Big Chest. Um, Yeah. It's just I don't see them doing a Jarvis Jones, a Bud Dupree, or TJ Watt first round, especially picking at 20. I think that there's better value now, uh, you know, kind of almost in the middle of the first round that – you snag a wide receiver or we're going to get the cornerback here, which is obviously one of the ones that jumps off the page once again, unfortunately, rearing its ugly head once again. We cannot get away from it. Uh, this is something interesting. I was pulling up. This is uh, overthecap.com. I was looking at the Steelers contracted players right now, and there's only six players, and this includes Antonio Brown, by the way, that are making more money as far as a cap number this year, I have a higher cap number than Bud Dupree. That's kind of tough. That's that's a real tough pill to swallow. So when you get kind of you're, you're thinking about it now. On the flip side, what are you paying Bud Dupree? Remember we had mentioned about like Bruce Irvin money. We we compared him to what Bruce Irvin. We compared him to Justin Houston. And yeah. I'm going to pull that number up here in a second. But the guy's making more money. Joe Hayden. Oh, everybody's making north of 10 million. So Bud Dupree's at 9.2 here. Uh, Joe's almost at 12. DeCastro's almost at 12. Two at thirteen six, Hayward uh, almost fifteen, and then you got the two big money guys, Antonio Brown with a cap hit of twenty two point one, and Big Ben obviously at twenty three point two. He's making yeah. more money than Alejandro Villanueva, Marquise Pouncey, Vince Williams, Marcus Gilbert, Morgan Burnett's up there. We're going to be talking about him, uh, and then you got Vance McDonald, Chris Boswell, and then you start to get into you know some of the rookie contracts depending on if they're first rounder. So Artie Burns obviously accruing more money for this year, and then he's not a huge cap hit by any by any any sense uh, or, or means. If people are going to be like cut him, cut him, cut him, cut him, and eh, well we'll see. Uh, Three million, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. T.J. Watt two and a half. So you're kind of in that kind of ballpark right now where you're looking at this and you're just like that's kind of cra- that's some crazy money but depending on uh I'm, let me pull up justin houston here and uh, i'll get your thoughts um you know I, like i said i think the money is high but relatively speaking what they'd have to pay to go out and replace him 
I don't, I, I just don't know. Look, you know, we had speculated about this earlier that maybe they'd try and get a more cap friendly deal. I, I just think that they're looking at this like, okay, we're going to give this to you, but this is your prove it season now. You, you showed us a little bit and you've continued to show us a little bit every year. You need to really put it all together because if, if, if you don't, it's not going to be just us that's not paying you. Nobody's going to pay you, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and you, you kind of have to hope that that's where it goes. I, I don't, again, I don't like paying uh, Bud Dupree that much money at a position where he is probably, well, I don't even want to say probably, he is not producing at that level. Um, the stats simply just aren't there. But he also is not nearly as bad as Steelers Nation makes him out to be. Um, you know, he, he he's had a much higher rating in PFF with their weird wizardly ways. Uh, he's gotten a lot more pressures in the last season. Yes, he still over pursues. He still, you know, over rushes, whatever you want to call it. He, he gets beyond the quarterback and then has to work his way back. But he, he was much more effective on, on this new flipped side than he was in the past seasons. And, you know, so it's hard. It's, it's just, it's hard because the athletic traits are there. The skill set seems to be there. The guy appears to be a hard worker. Um, and while I kind of think he might run his mouth a little too much sometimes, it's not at the Mr. Big Chest level, so I can live with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can live with anything like that. Um, yeah. It's just tough looking at, you know, this is over the cap. Once again, they have the three, four outside linebackers. Um, looking at the contracts, of course, Justin Houston on here, average per year, is the fourth highest paid. And, I mean, uh, we're talking all the way back in – he signed this contract in 2015. It was uh, more. It looks more than likely like an extension uh, as opposed to a new one, or they just structured it in a way that his cap number was 5.1 in 2015. So you're talking about four years ago, five years ago now. Um, then it went to 13-1, 22-1, 26, 20.1 for 2019 and 19 – mill next year and of course he sacks quarterback a lot more and some people are probably like are you crazy you're comparing Bud Dupree to Justin Houston we did this exercise geez I think it was heading into last year and it had to deal with how many players fall into this uh three four edge kind of category and how often they uh, drop into coverage and Dupree and TJ Watt drop into coverage like way more than most any and that you know they're not just primarily running after the quarterback like James Harrison or Lamar Woodley were and you look at these kind contracts and it's like Khalil Mack, Von Miller, Olivier Vernon, you know, <laughs> 23 and a half mil, 19 mil, 17 mil. You get into like Clay Matthews and Nick Perry, 13 and, and 12 on an average for per year. Ryan Kerrigan, uh, Brian Arakpo, uh, you know, Arakpo at 7 7. Jadavion Clowney's getting into this uh, beyond rookie contract stuff. You can't really put Bradley Chubb in there uh, either because he's it's a rookie contract thing. So, you know, you get, you get a few too, like Dante Fowler, some of these things are going to start coming into play now as these guys become uh, free agents. Terrell Suggs, uh, you know, 37 years old. What's his, what's his value at this point? Will he still play? Uh, some other guys like Shane Ray coming off a rookie contract. I think it's going to be interesting to see what the market is because there's not a whole lot of guys, and I wonder what teams may overpay. And then this is really going to depend on Bud Dupree's 2019 as well as his 2020 because we don't know what this market's going to look like it might get skewed just because of the lack of available free agents. Uh, probably their best choice, the Steelers being, is going to be finding one of these guys in the draft. Now, all that said, we still have to look at inside linebackers. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me see. who Who's all coming up here under contract? I thought that Bostic was only a one-year deal, but now I'm not – no, I'm not seeing that. Um, but anyway, uh, you know – You've got Vince Williams. He's under contract. LJ Fort is going to be a free agent. Tyler Matakevich. And we just heard news that uh, the Steelers, at least Kevin Colbert, with his press conference from the Combine, is not an they're not anticipating Ryan Shazier to play in 2019, but he will be, quote, part of the team. So now this leaves you with John Postick kind of lost his role uh, through – Mid-season, I would say, and LJ Fort ascended, but LJ Fort is a guy that is going to be a free agent here, unrestricted. 
what do you do in the case of an inside linebacker? And are you inclined to think the inside linebacker may be more important than outside linebacker? My opinion on this is with the way they use the players in the secondary and safeties, and depending on how this shapes up, and we're going to talk about that in a moment too, that maybe this isn't the highest price. It's definitely in the mix. This is like a day two and day three throw a flyer or a dart at somebody type of deal, in my opinion, even though everybody's like, go out there and get the next Shazier. I I don't know. There's some value there, though, Brian, from what you guys are all saying about the middle rounds, too. So where do you put inside linebacker on your priority list for the Steelers defense in 2019? Um, it's it's pretty high, but I want to address the replace Ryan Shazier. Uh, <laughs> not th- that's not possible. <laughs> it, you can't. You know, you're talking about if not a generational player, a decade, you know, once in a decade type player. You can't replace Ryan Shazier. What you can do is improve where you are, and and I think that is an important aspect of of what they need to do. Um, they the reason that they play so many odd fronts last year was to try and compensate for the fact that Ryan Shazier was no longer there. And they simply didn't have the personnel to do it. Do I think it's important for them to get back to that? Uh, yeah, I think they need to make an improvement here. Now, again, as with many things, <laughs> that you know, the top three guys that people look at are Bush, uh, the guy from LSU, and I can't remember. Oh, uh, I can't Mac Wilson, but I and Zach Meckler and I have talked about this many times. Uh, and while you know, uh, White Devin White, who's the kid from SU, might be okay. I don't, you know, if if at twenty your choice is him or one of the top corners, you don't go that way. Um, and there is some quality guys that they can have, like Joe Giles Harris. Um, who Zach absolutely loves, and I'm starting to uh, uh, join the hype train and hive for. Uh, but you can get him probably in the second round. So, yes, I wh- do I think this is a day one priority? Only if that is the best value on the board. It is not what I consider the top priority, but it's high. Yeah, I don't think this is going to get fixed with a free agent. I think you're looking at no. uh, a John Bostic type deal. And by the way, that was a two year, so I had a brain fart there, as per usual. But I look at guys like Preston Brown, uh, you know, cup of coffee there with the Bengals, um, Manti Teow, like CJ Mosley. They're probably the Ravens are not going to let that guy to leave the door. <laughs> not chance. Yeah, I don't think there's there's any chance of that. Um, you know, like you get down to like somebody like a Kevin Minter or uh, let me see who else is on here, Albert McClellan or something. I mean, it, it, McClellan's 33 years of age now. Uh, for, you know, and what are you can do with something like that. I, I don't know that there's anybody that's really going to fill that that role I mean you look I go down this list and it's like guys we talked about in previous uh, draft previews like a Quan Alexander it's like well, he's right on par with LJ Fort why would you why would you go with the the devil you don't know you know what I mean same yeah. thing with like a Vince Beagle or something these are your lower end uh guys that are going to be just without a home probably until after the draft is going to be my guess. They're not going to be high priority type free agents. So they're going to have to look to the draft for something like this. I think at least with Bostic in place, Williams in place, bring Fort back, Matikevich, they could still bring in, they could draft somebody. A lot of people are going to be upset if they don't. And if they miss, you know, trying to swing for like the, when they went to, you know, Leighton Vander Esch, for example, or who was the other guy that went to the Titans? Was that Rashawn Evans? Um, yeah, you know, no, he went. Did no. he go to? Well, I don't know who he went to the Bears. Somebody went to the Bears. Yeah, and uh, you know, Roquan Smith went to the Bears. Yeah, Roquan Smith. There you go. Uh, Roquan was never in the equation last year, but you thought maybe no. the LVE or Evans or somebody could have been there when the Steelers were picking. And, you know, do they get stuck in this same type of scenario in uh, this year's draft where, you know, were they necessarily looking at Darius Leonard? Did anybody know that Darius Leonard was going to be Darius Leonard when the Colts took him in the second round? No, I don't Zach. think so. Zach yeah, did. yeah. Well, you know the what? The professor did. The professor is one of the few. That's why we call him the professor. Um, Absolutely. But you know what this also depends on? How many picks? You're talking about this. You were just talking about this. 
How many picks? That, what kind of pick? Where in the draft? When is it going to be a 2019 pick? If the Steelers make this, they deal Antonio Brown. I think this could kind of skew this to where you could grab maybe a corner or wide receiver and an inside linebacker with you know the the first two rounds, or assuming you either get a first round or a second rounder, uh, an additional one for Antonio Brown. So I, I don't disagree with you whatsoever with that. Um, but if they don't. Then it's like, well, now you're looking at the cornerback depth chart. I'm not going to look at that yet. Ha, I'm going to save that for last because that'll be the best. <laughs> I, I'm still looking at this safety depth chart. And I mean, they've already invested in Terrell Edmonds as a draft pick, Marcus Allen last year, Sean Davis, uh, who's going to be coming up for free agency here as well. And Sean Davis has been an Iron Man. I think, you know, this poor kid, he's been. Just, I guess he's not really a kid anymore, but you know how as we know him when he comes in. All these guys are kids when you're older than them. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sean Davis is just, you know, he's still in his rookie contract, entering the fourth year of that, and he's been moved around. I say he's a poor kid because they move him around everywhere and ask all these demands of him, and you don't hear a peep. And I think it's just because he solidly does his job, but doesn't do anything that jumps off the page necessarily. And I, I look at, uh, I think Terrell Edmonds, I, I was just watching, they had it as one of the games of the week a week or two ago, and I, I can't, or one of the games of the year, I think it was number 10, Steelers and Chargers. And I'm like, yeah, this farce, because not only did you have those things with the false start penalty mm-hmm. and all that. I'm not going to get into the refs stink today, but the refs stink. Terrell Edmonds, right after they play Renegade, hits, um, I'm trying to think who it was, uh, Jackson or Melvin Gordon didn't play in that game. One of the running backs gets like a little dump off screen pass and takes a little, takes a turn and takes a step and Edmonds lights him up and the ball comes loose. And I could see Edmonds doing more of that. I see, I see flashes when I was at uh, the various training camp practices and things of that nature. But um, as far as safety, like, what do you do? They, presumably, it's Davis and Edmonds as the starters. Morgan Burnett, unhappy. But Morgan Burnett, you were hurt, buddy. I mean, I think the Steelers had a defined role with you, and I think it's just a case of there's so many other things going on. I don't think they're looking to release or get rid of Morgan Burnett. You need to sit him down and say, hey, you're a veteran. This is the role that we're looking at for you, and hopefully he's happy with that. And, you know, you got other guys that are still kind of flailing around back there. Jordan Dangerfield and Brian Allen and Malik Golden and these kind of guys guys that you know can fill out maybe that fourth or fifth spot in the safety depth chart I don't see safety being a very oh, and of course there's the missile who got hurt too that could always yeah. be brought back probably on the cheap Nat Burhe so I don't see I don't see in this offseason and the internal moves that they make is going to be probably the most as far as priorities with the safety position yeah it's look I Sean Davis got a lot of grief for not uh blowing up the world in the move to free safety um, but I, I think he did an adequate job. Uh, I think he can grow into the position uh, another year here. Um, and you know, we don't know how Morgan Burnett would have fit in because as you said, he's been hurt. He was hurt a, a, a huge number of the season. The best thing about that is Terrell Edmonds got a lot of experience and, you know, a lot of times when rookies don't get to play, you don't expect to see the kind of growth from year one to year two uh, that you might want. Well, Edmonds Edmonds was a much better player at the end of the season than he was in the beginning of the season. And it's not unreasonable to expect a lot more growth out of him in this second season. Um, so I, I think safety is, you know, it's, an, uh, it's a tough position because depending on how things go, with trying to draft an inside linebacker, if they decide that nothing fits for them there or they're not going to get the kind of player that they want, now you're talking about they have to utilize that nickelback position a lot more. And Morgan Burnett doesn't like playing. It doesn't mean that they won't make him play it. But that's not where he feels the most comfortable. And now you have to start thinking about, okay, well, if the right guy is there, somebody like maybe Chauncey Gardner or whatever his name is, um, do do you then say okay i can pull the plug on this uh, it's it's a position that i don't feel is of need but it could become that way depending on as we keep saying about other stuff too it could become more of a issue when they're drafting depending on what is or isn't available to them at that particular spot 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you kind of segued into the nickel corner type thing because Mike Hilton is an exclusive rights free agent. I think he's a phenomenal player. And we may as well look at the other corners because you still have Cam Sutton who's shown flashes. He's another guy they kind of asked to do all sorts of different things, play on the outside, which, you know, he had a snafu or two here or there, uh, play on the inside where I think he's way better suited. Uh, I don't know that he's Mike Hilton. Uh, But then again, we haven't gotten to see enough to know, and that's where your depth is. Obviously, you have the lockdown corner with Joe Hayden, but the elephant in the room is, is like, hey, they, uh, what is it, broken clock is right twice a day, and uh, Cody Sensabaugh was right more often than that last year, and you would have never guessed that after, what, two dogs, one bone (laughs) with Ross Cockrell. Yeah. And uh, bringing in Artie Burns and Artie Burns being a number one overall pick. Got to use that number one pick. Got to use, got to get a corner. Got to get a corner top overall. We, we were looking at the first round picks with a lot of corners. And I guess more or less you're taking a gamble. It's kind of like quarterback. You know what I mean? You got to get the guy, you're, you're paying for a guy with size uh, in yeah. certain measurables. And they did that with Artie Burns and it didn't work out. And, I, well, I agree, finding that guy opposite Joe Hayden is a priority once again this offseason. I would not be upset to see them bring back Cody Sensabaugh and then use a pick somewhere in the draft on this. And I guess it's where it falls into us talking about wide receiver in the previous episode because, you know, where do you take a wide receiver? I know you're all in on DK Metcalf. And it's like, hey, if he's there and that's what you use, that's great. You know what I mean? It kind of reminds me of drafting like San Antonio Holmes or something. You know what I mean? Best, But I think they yep. could still go best player available. And it still depends on what your draft capital is when you maybe when you when you deal Antonio Brown as to what they do with these picks. But I'd have to say corner and wide receiver, maybe the top two. And I think that may surprise some people who are really linebacker centric as far as outside linebacker and or inside linebacker because because I think the defense can drastically change if you get a guy who is at least ready by maybe October. Maybe he doesn't start right away and you plug Cody in. You bring Cody back and you plug Cody in there and, and see what Cody does. Maybe Cody's still solid. He's 2018 Cody. Or he reverts to not-so-great Cody of the previous years with the Steelers. But we know Cody Sensabaugh was a kind of a high-profile free agent when, the, what, the Rams gave him some money or was it the Giants or I'm trying to think. Or he got cut and then went to the Giants, and et cetera, et cetera. He kind of like yeah. – he, he, he had a dip and he's inconsistent. So you can't just roll just with Cody. You're going to have to address this some other way. But then again, it's what are you doing in the offseason? There isn't like a Joe Hayden. Even Joe Hayden wasn't available for free agency when they yeah. got Joe Hayden. So I don't, I don't know what you do there, but I think they definitely make a move uh, unless they find somebody that's comparable to a Cody Sensabaugh as a free agent that makes, uh, makes sense for the right price tag. I think it's going to be one of their higher draft priorities as well at the cornerback position. Yeah, I, I, look, to me, the corner position is what they need to address um, regard, it, regardless of anything else. Uh, but it is a position that, again, if you if you miss out on the top tiers, you cannot reach in the first round for. Um, you know, if the guys who are really a great fits for the Steelers and are the projected high-end corners are gone, you can't reach at 20 and just take a corner because you got to take a corner. You got to go BPA at that point. Um, so while I think this is the priority for them, and at least in the simulations that I've done, most of the mock drafts I've done, the guy that I want, the guy that Zach wants, the guy that we think is is the best cover corner in this draft is usually available. But this is all pre-combine, and all that nonsense can change after the combine um, if he blows it up. And I'm talking about Byron Murphy. Um yeah. You know, if he blows things up at the combine, forget it. He's going to be gone. Top um, 10. Top 10. Know. Maybe even go as yeah, high as like, d- who saw Denzel Ward at four last year? I mean, and he, exactly. had, he had a phenomenal year with Cleveland, too. It's kind of, I, I'm kind of jealous because, you know, we're Buckeye, Buckeye guys here. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like, absolutely. It ticks me off looking at that. I don't want to see you do good for the Browns. <laughs> I want to see you do good, but, you know, doing well for the opponent or, or, or a division rival is no bueno. <laughs> Yeah. So I I look at this and say corner is what I think is the top need. And it it stays that way regardless of what happens with Antonio Brown. But, but 
if they get a first rounder for Antonio Brown so that they can have they have two choices in the top in the you know in the first round of the draft then wide receiver starts to come heavily into my play I, I will I will say this I will say this if we get uh, you know, even if we don't get a, a, the draft pick for Antonio Brown, if we get a second round draft pick for Antonio Brown, there are going to be decent corners to be had in the second round. And if Metcalf is there, I'm still going him. <laughs> oh, you, you, so uh, Metcalf uh, at the maybe around the top of the second round, that would be something, wouldn't it? That'd oh no, be... no, no, in the first, he's oh, never going to be there in the second. So round. I wouldn't think so either. I was just like, well, you never know what these people are doing with these stupid uh, big boards and stuff. I mean, it would take something like uh, pretty tragic. Remember, we had who was it? Sidney Jones that got hurt pretty bad yeah. and and fell like you know fourth round. A guy was probably like a lock to be a top twenty pick, and you have these unfortunate things that happen, and you can never you never can predict what will happen, but. Um, kind of to just put a bow on all of this. I think we're agreeing with uh, another offensive weapon in wide receiver, especially a, a really, uh, like I said, we were talking about Calvin Ridley just the other day. And, you know, putting him with the Falcons. Now, the Falcons' defense was not good last year, and they had some other issues, but uh, mo mostly injury related. So it it's tough to pin that uh, there and be like, well, look what the Falcons did. Yeah, they didn't make the playoffs either. So, <laughs> but uh, it looks good on paper, at least. And I would be very excited with, uh, with that type of talent there when you're talking about Juju and some of the other guys on offense. It's tough to just uh, say, nah, they'll be just fine at wide receiver with what they got. When you have Ben Roth, Roethlisberger, and if you can count on having a healthy Vance McDonald, perhaps because we've seen what Ben's been able to do with uh, you know with rookies or, or uh, inexperienced players. But then again, there is also the Ben that said, "Well, the moment was too big when you had like you were rolling with Demarcus Ayers and Kobe Hamilton and and Sammy Coates and guys of that that nature too." You never can tell how any of this is going to turn out. So the best you could do is hedge your bets. I think uh, they'll look to free agency and the draft, probably wide receiver and corner being among the tops. Would you put the two linebacker positions next in order because that's kind of what I'm looking at, and then they probably round out the draft by you know the day three pick. It's an obligatory, let's grab maybe a defensive lineman or another linebacker if they haven't got one already or a running back or something of that nature. Yeah, that, that's about where I go. Look, I, cornerback to me is the top priority. Uh, wide receiver is 1A. Um, and then linebacker is probably 1C or 1B or whatever. They're all kind of mixed in based on how the draft falls. Mm -hmm. um, and... Beyond that, yeah, I think they got to get some depth at defensive line. They'll pick an offensive lineman somewhere in the draft. Uh, a running back wouldn't be a bad thing, although I'm leaning towards I wish they could sign a vet, as we talked about last time around when we talked about this, just to, to round out that room a little better. Um, but if they can't, hey, they're going to have to they, – they still need some depth there. Uh, they, could, they could draft a running back some point in time. But yeah, to me, corner, corner, wide receiver, and and the inside linebacker position are at the top level of your needs. Outside linebacker, D line, in the middle of there, and then everything else. So where do you put tight end <laughs> in a very uh, in a I, very deep draft for for the position? <laughs> I put tight end uh, at, at at kind of uh, a limbo position. In other words. It's nice if you can't get the wide receiver you want, but you can get an athletic, really dynamic tight end, somebody like a Noah Fan or a Hawkinson uh, that falls in the right place. I'm okay with that because, again, you've replaced a receiving threat with another receiving threat. Um, but I don't, you know, do I pass on DK Metcalf to pick up uh, no. the tight end? No, no absolutely no. not. <laughs> I mean, it's, you're kind of salivating too at the fact of we still don't know the draft capital. Uh, there's no compensatory picks this year for the Steelers, but they have nope. a they have a pretty big trading uh, kind of bargaining chip in Antonio Brown that could net them multiple picks. So you just never know. It could be something where you have a third or a fourth rounder, and one of these guys are on their board, and boom, there goes a tight end. But I had to bring it up because that you know that's another uh, I would be saying elephant in the room a lot uh, maybe this off season. But it's something that they could definitely look at with the plethora of talent that's there, and also seeing that Jesse James and Xavier Grimble are impending free agents, more than likely one or potentially both uh, 
I don't. I hate saying saying that Xavier Grimble brought back because you know it's the same scenario as last year. He's going to have to fight for a job if he signs a contract this off season. So, uh, but that's yeah. where I view tight end, and of course, you know, running back always falls into that category of hey, this is a guy we could throw out there as a kick returner. Whether they find that in free agency or the draft, this is kind of like an overall off season kind of synopsis uh, overview before the real deal. This free agency period kicks off here uh, in in short time so uh brian always good to have you on buddy any uh closing remarks for all of our great listeners out there metcalf or bust metcalf or bust <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna upset the professor with that one i, I don't know he's uh he's leaning corner pretty heavy isn't he he is i just uh, i'm worried that they're not going to be there yeah, yeah, absolutely, especially he, at 20. Look, Metcalf runs fast. He's not going to be there either. So, <laughs> Well, that's very true. That's very true. I mean, it all depends on all the other teams and their needs, and there's you know people that are going to trade, and you never know. I mean, uh, John Gruden is on record saying that he would be okay with dealing some of these first-round picks. So come Let's and get, get four. Let's come, get four. <laughs> come, come and get it, Chucky. Come and get it. So, All right, folks, my name's Joe. His name's Brian. Uh, until next time, don't forget to comment. Don't forget to subscribe. My name's Joe. I think I already said that. And his name's Brian. We always encourage you to be safe, be good, and we'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 